What I'm going to share with you today changes the world. I'm not overestimating. So, you know that I, John Burroughs, James Warren, and Ray Hobbs have been researching the Rendlesham Forest incident for over four years now. And there's one incredible piece of evidence that keeps on coming up, and that's what is the connection between Rendlesham Forest and this mysterious facility built on Orford Ness called the Cobra Mist Radar Facility. Now, you all know that the highly strange events of 1980, where John Burroughs and other U.S. servicemen encountered something which actually injured them and um, was extremely highly strange, all occurred long after this Cobra Mist radar facility, which was just a few miles from Rendlesham Forest, was closed. It has nothing to do with it, but it has. Because the people who advised that the Cobra Mist radar facility was shut down were still in the area. I'm talking about a company called SRI, or Stanford Research International. They are the Thunderbirds, the international rescue of fixing hard stuff. And for some reason, they stayed at Bentwaters and at Marshallsham Heath, carrying on whatever the Cobra Mist project failed to do. So if we understand why SRI stayed and why they advised the Cobra Mist radar facility to suddenly close down, we might understand what really happened in Randlesham Forest. So out of the blue, I got contacted via an email with this person who wanted to tell me something um, really earth-shattering about the Cobra Mist facility. Oh, I'm all ears, said I. So you need to understand the background to the story that he is going to tell you. So today he agreed to be interviewed. And he spills the beans and explains why, in his opinion, Cobra Mist was never an over-the-horizon radar, but it was a special weapon system. And he will explain how it worked, and also we'll discuss how the system would have affected Suffolk and the Rendlesham Forest area. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a story about why this guy first got interested in Cobra Mist. And it's hilarious, but also very revealing. So Cobra Mist was supposedly an over-the-horizon radar, a way of looking deep into the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And it was built on Orford Ness, which is the shingle spit off the coast of Suffolk. But something about it supposedly didn't work. After a small amount of UK pounds and a very large amount of US dollars were spent on building it, they suddenly shut it down, like, overnight. In this document, you can clearly see, and I think it's true, that the Americans had a contract with RCA, who were the equipment supplier, to make the system work. And they had something called a break clause, where at a certain date, if you didn't renew the contract, you could jump out of the contract and walk away. And this break clause was just about to come up. And the US said, for whatever reason, they decided to shut it down, and we'll go into that, that they were going to invoke the break clause uh, next week. British citizens, radio technicians, electronic service personnel, no doubt security and other people, mainly from the Ipswich and Suffolk area, travelled and worked at Cobra Mist site every single day. And if you close the place down next week, 
as the Americans wanted to do to get out of the RCA break clause, it would automatically trigger an employment tribunal because these people were on probably monthly salaries. And, you know, by closing the place down and firing them next week, they didn't have enough notice. And so they will complain. And the British government said, well, you can't do that. Americans said, we have to. If we go a day over the RCA contract, we're buggered. Excuse my French. British people turned up the day after it was shut and were turned away probably by a private security company who were just managing the gates and said, no, it's shut, mate. You need to go home. And they all got together and said, we're filing a complaint. And that got into the national papers. The reporters needed a photograph, so they probably went to the MOD and said, do you have a photograph of this Cobra Miss site that we could print with our story about this um, work tribunal? And they were given this aerial picture of the Cobra Mist antenna set up. And that's where my guest today comes in. He's a leading antenna radio person. He was working in a facility that I can't name with a whole lot of people who build and understand radio systems, right? And by the water cooler, or it was written by the tea, in the morning, the Daily Mail or whatever it was they saw had the picture about this radar facility that got their interest and a photograph of it from the air with the story that it had suddenly shut down because it had not worked. <laughs> What these radio experts, antenna builders, all did was laugh. Because they looked at the picture while my guest was standing in the group having a tea in the morning and said, no wonder it doesn't work. Look at it. It's built backwards. What? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would... The UK and the US and RCA build an over-the-horizon system in Orford Ness, uh, pointing towards Rendlesham and southwest England, when it was supposed to be pointing out across the North Sea to the Soviet Union. No, it, well, obviously, that can't be the reason why it didn't work. It would be insane. <laughs> so this guest today has spent 20 years with that piece of information, that memory of the events where his colleagues in the antenna building business said, it's built backwards, trying to understand what Cobra Mist really was. Today, I have the privilege of introducing to you the man who found the answer to what Cobra missed probably really was. Today we've got a fantastic guest, one of the people that I've been so honored to meet because of my humble YouTube channel, and he will tell you what he's done in his life because Peter knows a lot about what I'm interested in about radio astronomy and is specifically has got a lot to say about Cobra Mist. So, Peter, who the hell are you? I'm a senior design engineer for aerospace electronics, uh, meaning a lot of stuff with aircraft like Airbus, um, uh -huh. uh, things like ion drives for spacecraft. Uh, oh. I've worked with the European Space Agency. Uh, right. I'm also be involved with radio astronomy. I've been doing radio astronomy yeah. for many, many years. And yeah. Uh, yeah, science and physics just basically has interested me all of, my, all of my life since Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. That's how I got infected with engineering. Man's greatest adventure. Absolutely. So, so radio astronomy and, uh, and radio is a real passion and uh, an interest of yours. Um, you certainly worked in large radio telescopes and you understand radio signals and systems. Can we talk today about something very interesting? In um, the 1960s, I thought, I think it was envisaged, the, the idea of this system called an over-the-horizon um, radar. Actually, we should go back a bit and talk about how do they work? 
can you just explain how radio signals propagate and what's this ionosphere business and how does that apply to um, to an over the horizon radar? Maybe that's a bit too many questions. First of all, let's talk about the ionosphere and radio. What's going on there, Peter? Well, the ionosphere is basically free ions. They're floating up in, in, in the atmosphere a couple of right. hundred kilometers high. Right. Uh, there's an interesting thing that happens. It's called the day-night rhythm, which means when the sun is shining on the ionosphere, the gases expand and right. uh, disappear above, which mm -hmm. makes little electrical signals, which the birds can hear. And that oh. is why they tweet in the morning. It's called the dawn chorus. They're listening oh, yeah. to the ionosphere, making I funny noises. And when the sun disappears, the ionosphere cools down and it shrinks. So it drops in height. And it goes up mm -hmm. and down by about 200 kilometers every day. So wow. that's an, interest, an interesting thing. Uh, animals who use their nerve systems, like sharks and mm -hmm. birds, they can hear this. It wakes them up in the morning. So that's oh, why wow. the cockerel crows in the morning, because he's heard the ionosphere. Um, so that's one of the, one of the aspects of, of the ionosphere. The other thing is it can reflect radio waves if the radio waves are low in frequency, like VHF. Uh -huh. VHF, the radio waves, they skip up to the ionosphere and skip down again, bounce off the ground and go up again. And Can I just the... ask a, a really basic question here? So the ionosphere is basically part of our atmosphere, but it's high up, so it's on the edge of our planet's uh, atmosphere surrounding our planet. And I take it you're calling it an ionosphere because it's partially ionized and an ionized so it's it's our atmosphere our normal oxygen nitrogen co2 and other stuff that is partially ionized and and would you confirm that an ionized gas in its semi-plasma state has magnetic properties so it, it's not just gas it suddenly becomes um able to become a charge system uh, have i got that roughly right yeah, roughly. Um, if you look at James Clark Maxwell uh, yeah. and Heinrich Hertz, uh, basically James Clark Maxwell with his Maxwell's equations, he right. said you've always got an E field and an H field, where E uh -huh. field is electric, H is magnetic. So right. always where you've got an electric field, you've also got a magnetic field. So you are right. Uh, the ionosphere is like free electrons floating around. And they've been stripped from their atoms. Right. So they're like flying between, between. And it makes like a mirror for radio waves. Right. Like the ionosphere isn't agitated through gamma radiation, X-ray radiation, etc. from uh -huh. the sun. Right. Um, the ions recombine to their atoms and the mirror gets translucent and you can look through it and there's no reflection at all. I so for, for, for short waves, um, the uh, the waves get reflected through the the electrons that are flying between the atoms because it's right. like a semi permeable mirror. So, so the, the reason sun... that they the reason that our atmosphere is ionized is because of the energy coming from the sun. The upper part of the Earth's atmosphere is bombarded so the um, by energetic um uh, energy and it, it 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 tends to it it partially ionizes it turning it into um so the lower parts of our atmosphere are just gas not ionized it's it, it's the only upper it's the upper part and that energy has come from our sun you're a bit right there are different layers and you've got e e layers and f layers and they've got oh, yeah. under layers like f1 f2 etc they've got d layers and all sorts of layers right right and the lowest ones they stay ionized ah from the electromagnetic field of the earth so that's right. why we've got shortwave radio at night which uses this bounce effect right Oh, so the lower layers aren't being ener energized by the sun directly. They stay energized because of the magnetic field of our planet. Oh, yeah, that... because, because our, our Earth is obviously Great. causing all sorts of radiation. Oh, fantastic. So... You want me to go over to over the horizon radar slowly? Yeah. So we've established that you can bounce a um, some radio frequencies off this mirror in the sky. So um, 
what was the birth of the idea of uh, looking over the horizon using the ionosphere and a radar? How did that come about? You've got to go back to the 1950s. Right. It was after the Second World War and mm -hmm. the so-called communist threat <laughs> yeah. uh, came up, which the Americans were very into. And yeah. they managed to um, persuade the British to go along with it. And, um, well, everything was going in the direction of science. An interesting thing, uh, Sir Bernard Lovell was building the Jodrell Bank radio telescope in, in he, the north, he northwest of England. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> as I see your T-shirt. And yep. the funny thing was, his radio telescope was almost finished. Uh -huh. However, RAF Filingdales. Uh -huh was in the middle of all kinds of catastrophes and it was just not coming on at all. So the detection of the Sputnik was a case of, oh, we've got some old scrap radar from the Second World War in the shed. Let's right. bolt the focus and bolt let's on. get people yeah. with uh, wooden hammers to close the contact breakers on the electric motors. <laughs> and let's see if we can swing the dish that wasn't finished. It was just the mechanics, the motors, but nothing um... else. And using theodolites, <sighs> looking at the focus point, they were able to recalculate where the dish was actually pointing yeah. using field telephones. They were like communicating it. with the focus. Oh, yeah. And in the focus... Uh, they were ca uh, getting the reflections of the carrier rocket uh -huh. and the Sputnik. And the rest of the world was saying, oh, that's the Russians. They've got a shortwave transmitter and they're turning the power level up with some kind of uh, clock mechanism. And then they're turning the power level down and they're trying to con us that they put a satellite into space. Uh -huh. Well, it was Bernard Lovell who actually saw the rocket and uh, Sputnik and prove to the world that um, right. the, the Russians had actually put a satellite into space. And it within was in orbit. Day, right. Yeah, right. within days, the whole of Jodrell Bank was crawling with American and British military people. Right. And it was suddenly discovered by the Americans, oh, the British, they are very, very clever. Uh, right. They're doing things that we can't. Mm -hmm. So it was this that forced America to look even deeper at the UK as a partner. Right. And this brings us over to things that were done in the UK, like Cobra Mist at Orford Ness. Right. So, so the story goes, and we this is what I really want to talk to you about today. So let's bust the mist. But if you look up the Wikipedia entry, this so this over the horizon radar that could obviously work by looking far distant into the Soviet Union was supposedly built and planned in the 1960s. And originally it was going to be a copy of an over the horizon radar that's on the east coast of the US. And it was going to be built in Turkey, but for some reason it wasn't built in Turkey. And Orford Ness, which is a shingle bank off the east coast of England in Suffolk, which of course points towards the North Sea and the Soviet Union, was um, was chosen as an alternative site. So they um, I can so I can understand why it would be good site for a genuine over the horizon radar. So do you think originally they actually intended to build an OTH at Orford Ness? I know for a fact this was not the case. Ha -ha. Right. So you can imagine people all over the world. They've got a little bit of information. But it's you, dear Simon. <laughs> you were bringing this information together. I knew nothing about the site in the United States. Oh, I knew right. nothing about the idea of using Turkey as a site for this uh, equipment. Supposedly, so yeah. you are doing an amazing job. You're bringing little snippets of information in the form of yeah. a film together. And people yeah. like me, we're just looking at it and thinking, wow. And I'm so yeah. happy to have been able to actually talk to you and yeah. start off this conversation.
Well, okay. I have lots of I have lots of little snippets of information, and I also like looking at the big picture. But I'm totally lacking any real science knowledge. I'm a filmmaker. I've worked in science films, but I'm not a scientist. And pe- talking to people like you, you can actually answer the nitty gritty, the the nuts and bolts. So, why do you think that the f- amazingly expensive, large um, facility that was built on a shingle bank? Ed Orford Ness was not an over the horizon radar. And what could it have been? It's very simple. The time they were building it, mm-hmm. the computing power did not exist to be able to process the information. That's the first thing you really need to know. Right. The Russians, they have always had VHF radar. Ah. Are these great big pictures that you see of lorries on the hill with these massive great antennas, which are basically banks and banks and banks of Yagi antennas. Right. Um, why? Because on VHF frequencies, you can see aircraft, which are supposed to be stealthy. Uh, right. Not stealth. The lower in frequency you get, the more you see the aircraft. It's the right. higher frequencies they get invisible. So right. gigahertz frequencies are invisible. So... You've got an existing radar station, which is Aria Filingdales in oh, yeah. North Yorkshire. Sure. Well, there's a very easy explanation why Orford Ness could never, ever have been for OTH. First of all, the technology did not exist then mm-hmm. to be able to see aircraft out of the clutter. Uh... So... We now go over to the thing that other people know about. It's called HARP, which is an ionospheric heating system. Right. What it it does is it heats up the ionosphere so you can reflect a radio wave from a radar to gain further distance. By height. So in America, America, they've got their radar systems and you've got a very low takeoff angle. Right. And you put the harp uh, in the United States a long way away from this radar system to heat the ionosphere to right. make a mirror in the ionosphere so your radar, which only sees a couple of hundred kilometers, so it can see further. So it can go is... higher and further, right. Correct. So yeah. it's like using a mirror to see further into the Soviet Union. So that is the reason for the existence of harp. Right. So, if you look in the UK, you will mm-hmm. discover that Aria Filingdales mm-hmm. is roughly on the same line as Orford Ness. It is. I hadn't thought so, about that. It is. So what, yes. So Aria Filingdales doesn't look vertically up. It looks out out of the towards the North Sea. Right. So what's the point of heating the uh, heating the ionosphere above? So we now say, oh, let's heat the ionosphere above Europe right. with a system from uh, Orford Ness. Hey, now we're getting Whoa. interesting. So you... Filingdales is the radar. Orford yeah. Ness is the mirror. Maybe Produces... the mirror. This maybe. Is the first... All right. No, 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 maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I'm going through the possibilities one by one. But hang, hang, oh. hang, hang on a da- goddamn minute. Harp, the reason HARP, H-A-A-R-P, was built in Alaska is because Alaska had so much damned energy left over from its oil production, natural gas, which was too far, too far, too far north to um, pipeline to uh, uh, the rest of the U.S., Orford Ness and Cobra Mist would have to have a massive power supply. Oh, hang on a minute. Isn't Sizewall A nuclear power station right next door? Yep. And Ah. why do you put underground high-tension cables that are incredibly expensive down to a shingle beach? And why don't you do it with normal electricity pylons? Uh And why, if it was only an over-the-horizon radar, which would take some power, but is mainly processing of power of the of the signal as you say the kind yeah, of Doppler yeah. shift but 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 why and we know 
there are incredibly large interconnect from Sizewell A, which was the first nuclear power station government built, uh, to, down the shingle bank to an over the horizon radar. Far more power than a radar would require, in my humble opinion. Correct. And well, this means we're slowly circling the truth. Yes. So but, it right. Go for it. But, you, but you've got your, your different possibilities. The first thing okay. is an over the horizon radar, which mm -hmm. can actually look at something. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't have the processing power then. Right. It was you got nice clear reflections from RAF filing dales, which could right. be seen on a cathode ray tube. Right. Well, you don't get that from a short wave over the horizon radar. It's no. incredibly cluttered. Right. So you need large amounts of computing power, which just didn't exist then. Right. So as an over the horizon radar, no, nope, offedness wasn't that. So the next possibility was, ah, they were heating up the ionosphere so they can have a mirror in the, up there so they can reflect signals from our air filing dales to see deeper into Russia. Hey, that's now getting interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. that's not the case. They weren't doing well, that. Well, wouldn't you be able to tell it was a ionospheric heater by looking at the antenna array? What clues are you got? When they, you know, when you look at old pictures of when Cobra Mist was actually fully up and running, as a radio professional and somebody who's worked in antennas and radio astronomy and knows what you're talking about, when you look at the old pictures of Cobra Mist, what are you thinking? What are you seeing? Is it, does it look like an over the horizon radar? An OTH radar. You need high gain and directivity. Right. You, oh, wouldn't yeah. use, you wouldn't use logarithmic periodic antenna. Right. You would have a massive, massive, massive field of right. antennas at a certain frequency, which uh, is the operating frequency of the radar system. And, and if you it, and they and they won't they won't necessarily be uh, fan shaped or directional. They would just uh, be a they would just be an array, wouldn't they? A field. And field, if you look, right. if you look at the British government's uh, OTH radar facility uh, right. left of RAF Akrotiri in real, Cyprus, in Cyprus, in yeah. Cyprus, you will see yeah. a real VHF OTH radar facility, and it looks nothing like the pictures of Cobra Mist. Nothing like it. So, Peter, is there a clue? Do you think? Um, from the shape, you know, it's not Duga, it's not Alcatiri. If you look at Cobra Mist and when it was suddenly closed down overnight, um, what reaction did you get in the professional radio astronomy community from what was going on at Orford Nest and Cobra Mist? Well, a lot of people looked at the, the pictures of the layout and just basically said, it can't work. If it is what they say it is, it's pointing 180 degrees in the wrong direction. Uh, and if you if you wow. look at it, right. if you look at it, the feed point is towards the North Sea, towards yes. Europe. Right. And the array is fanning out uh, all over the UK, towards North America, South America. Pointing towards Rendlesham, yeah. Bentwaters, yeah. and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to the southwest. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, tar yeah. the target of interest is the northeast. Correct. So that is the first thing that you really start scratching your head about. And you right. look at it, and um, you suddenly realize, hey, no way is that a transmitting system and receiving system for any kind of radar whatsoever. So now you have a few pictures that have been produced. Right. Public made public. Right. And you see the wires hanging in the air. Well, it's not an antenna. It's two parallel lines ah. where the bottom line is on the ground and the other line is in the air. And they're parallel or almost parallel. Right. Fact is at the right. far end, which They're is the end wedge. of the fan, 
Right. It's a wedge. It's a wedge. And the wedge is actually pointing to Europe. Right. So I got talking for a totally different project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a former government scientist. Okay. Remain nameless. And he, he was telling me matching technologies for wide band transmitters. Okay. And he suddenly showed me Orford Ness. He said, look, that's what it looks like. Okay. So what it what it basically is, it's an EMP weapon system. Oh, uh, right. So what they wanted to do, it was the 50s, the 60s, around about this area. They had the idea right. of sending very, very high energy pulses mm -hmm. with a pulse duration about in the, the area of picoseconds. Right. And sure. this is why the array has the shape that it does, because it's possible to send out an EMP right. targeted over Europe. Yeah. Weapon system. How and this well. is this is where I'm incredibly interested in your researchers with Rendlesham Forest. Right. Right. Because right, right, you have right. this American science group. Right. Who stayed in the UK in this area to do further research after uh, Cobra Mist was closed down. Right. OK, let me. So for my viewers sake, let me just tell that brief story. So um, the whatever Cobra Mist really was, it didn't work or it didn't work in a way that they wanted it to work supposedly and they um, they brought in thunderbirds international rescue who are called sri stanford research international a team of uh, of experts who have complete um, access to classified information and are working for both in this case the us and the uk government and they reported that it should be shut down immediately but the incredible thing that you've just mentioned which is a fact is that the sri team stayed in the eastern england area probably relocating to um, RAF and US Air Force NATO bent waters and to Martlesham, which was a uh, which was on the surface a British telecom phone laboratory, but in fact was a large laboratory with lots of other people who worked there. And so, why do you think that Cobra Mist was of great interest to SRI and UK, UK and, and US government. Do you think they wanted to develop it further? This is what's going to completely blow your mind, Simon. Yes. The cover story, completely forget it. It was okay. an EMP weapon system, which explains why you have the extreme high power connection to right. the nuclear power station. Right. And it explains also why everything is hidden underground, including the high voltage pylons and now underground cables. You of don't course. give this money out because of stupidity. You must have a reason. Right. So what they realized was if you were to fire this EMP weapon system in case the Russians came over by the Fulda Gap, Right. And you wanted to protect Europe, you, your EMP was going to wipe out Belgium, Holland, Germany right. in the process. Oh, dear. So, so this is the reason why they decided, oh, good idea, but politically not very good. <laughs> so I have it on very, very, very good authority. Yes. That they took the technology and downsized it right. to put it into green sea containers. Right. And these sea containers, it's a complete EMP weapon system mm -hmm. that you can come take to Germany. You can right. put it out on the ground and you can very quickly assemble right. a single antenna, which is pointing in the direction that you want to whack the Soviets in, in into the Stone Ages.
without and taking is, out Belgium. Right. Correct. And that right. is the true reason why the system by Orford Ness, Ness was closed down. It, it, the Cold War was changing. It was too powerful. The, the political fallout from Cobra Mist would be too incredible uh, to to actually use. Um, and uh, they probably did some tests with it at low power. And um, it was containerized back of a truck. Now put it nearer the potential Cold War enemy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. So it's it's completely logical if you think about it. They well, were going totally crazy in the fifties and the sixties, sure. building even bigger and bigger things without actually turning their brains on. Right. And when they'd actually built it, they realized, whoops, we can't do this because we're going to wipe out our NATO allies mm -hmm. as well as our own troops. Right. And then it was, they a, realized, it was almost a do it was a doomsday weapon. It, of... it was too big. It was, it was too just big. too big. I, 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 I'm going to ask you something. Um, this is my scatterbrain. I, I, I still want to think a bit about um, um, about Filingdales and um, Harp. Isn't isn't there a Harp system in Norway? A, a or um, that could have been the the um, the mirror in the sky. That yeah. NATO could have used. Do you know about? Isn't it called Urca? Urca? Many many years in yeah. the in the fifties and sixties, right? There was a oh civilian science research. Mm -hmm. Let's do ionospheric research. Yeah, and this was in the Scandinavian countries. It was a mm -hmm. system called IceCat. IceCat, that's right. What they did was they had whacking great big parabolic antennas, and yeah. they were heating up the ionosphere. Yeah to research it right well funnily enough um this would be exactly in the right position for aria filing dales to see deep mm -hmm. into the soviet union all right so, all right. That, so that's yeah, the yeah, way yeah. government works so yeah, there's another yeah. reason why offered ness was impractical because nato already had their heating system it was called ice cat and it was up in scandinavia so the uh, the whole IceCat story comes up very very clearly when I've been researching the Rendlesham Forest incident. Um, it seems that either a combination of Cobra Mist, well Cobra Mist was shut down by then, but SRI's work and IceCat was somehow involved in um, ionospheric heating. What exactly and why they were heating, I'm not actually prepared to say yet because although I have a very a strong clue of what they were actually doing um but so that's very very interesting can you talk just a little bit about um the power levels wouldn't cobra mist if it was an emp device need um some kind of capacitance storage and where would they be and i mean i mean you couldn't just turn it on with a flick of a switch you'd have to build it wouldn't it need some kind of capacitance Discharge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the first question you have to ask is, ooh, why have they got these massive underground cables going to war yeah. fitness? And they you don't do see them. No, no, so they, if you've got right. one thing you don't see, right. well, they've obviously got other things you don't see as well. Right. And uh, what you've got is things called Marx generators. And these mm. Marx generators, they are underground. Right. And what they do is they charge up and they generate single discharges. And right. that's what you have with an EMP. It's a single discharge. So right. all the facilities are underground. Uh, the next thing you know is, uh, yeah, we're next to the North Sea. So if you dig mm -hmm. a hole, it's going to flood with seawater. So how yeah. did they do the digging? Yes. Uh, well, that's, that's quite simple. Uh, mm. They... Uh, dug the holes uh, in the ground, and pumped out the water, right, right. put in what they wanted, and right. then covered it over with shingles. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the site certainly did flood a number of times, even when the Cobra Mist facility was open or or recently shut. Couldn't these um, giant capacitor banks actually be in the control uh, building, or you think nope. that would be they actually no. need to be very close to the feed point? Ah, 
and right. uh, the feed point is very, very clear. Right. So let's just go over that again. The feed is the feed point nearer the sea or nearer feed, um, feed point is nearer the sea, and right. the large tubes on the ground. Uh, tubes. You have to look at that as some kind right. of um, coax cable system. Right. Because when you want to have a directional system to fire in different directions, right, you've got to have a common feed point or it right. gets very, very complicated very, very, very quickly. And okay. um, yeah, that's why it is. So an EMP um, weapon system would need to be directional. I mean, you'd, you'd have to be is, able it to... Is, it is directional. Why don't you just underline for our viewers right now, just repeat why you think Cobra Mist over the horizon radar was not an over the horizon radar. It's very simple. The design is totally wrong. If you look today at CO2 lasers, which people build uh, themselves, DIY projects, it's basically yep. the same. You've got two parallel lines, which are a little bit of a wedge shape. And this mm -hmm. allows uh, a, a stimulation uh, of molecules to make a laser laser beam. So you see the physics today used in CO2 lasers. It's very, very clear. The military can only uh, work with the laws of physics. Right. And if you look at the pictures, the original pictures of the whole damn design of the place. Right. Never in 10,000 years can that be for over the horizon radar. It's that simple. Fantastic. I think I think that reveals a whole new big picture of what might have been going on in that fantastically interesting place with such an immensely interesting history called Orford Ness. I mean, um, Orford Ness, of course, is where Robert Watson Watt was first tasked as an ionospheric expert to look at Tesla's death ray. Not that he made it work. And, of course, it led to... Um, what he knew already existed was radar, or what that he called radio direction finding. Not that he invented it. Sorry, Robert, but, but Robert would agree with that. But Orford Ness has such an interesting history, AWRE, Atomic Weapons Research, it, uh, into British uh, nuclear weapon um, uh, casing and testing, centrifuge, huge heating and, and other things. It really is the Area 51 of England, it's specifically the most secret place and a perfect place to put an EMP weapon. Thank you very much. Um, I really think there's lots of questions that my viewers are going to have. I think your background is very, very interesting. I think you've chosen your words very carefully. I know because of things that we've talked about, you know your stuff. And what you told us here today is to very, very accurate description of what you have been told and what you know as a top um, a radio engineer. So thank you. Um, and I look forward to this conversation continuing. Simon, what you're doing is amazing. You know, you're you're bringing something in YouTube and in, in, in the Internet that a lot of people are interested in. Mm -hmm. And 99 percent of the people, they don't have the scientific or engineering knowledge, right. but they are interested. Yeah. Um, I I'm sitting a little bit in a vacuum because what I do is just so specialized. Yeah. You know, it's 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 like winning winning the lotto to find someone who is thinking in the same direction. So when oh. you started ranting on about Rendlesham Forest and all this other stuff, I yeah. thought myself, yippee, I have found someone who I can talk to. And there are probably many, many other people, uh, people listening to this this program today. You yes. may have the snippet of information. Yes. That we all do not know yes and you cannot imagine mm -hmm. if you were to tell this information to simon yeah what effect this would have because we have a massive puzzle with a yeah. few bits missing 
Yes. And you may have the little bit that you think, oh, it's incredibly boring what I've got. That's got no interest to anyone. You are probably right. totally wrong. Oh, that was truly fascinating. The information that you have just heard today fills in missing pieces of the jigsaw of Rendlesham Forest. If the Cobra Mist place was actually a weapon system and had a back scatter into the Rendlesham Suffolk area, it starts to explain a lot. And if, as Peter says, SRI were working at Bentwaters and Martlesham making a miniaturized EMP weapon system, suddenly we have a lot of answers. And then this turned up in Hansard, the British Parliamentary Record Document. Let me read it to you, and I think it's very clear that whatever they were doing at Cobra Mist had been further developed. My Lords, the House will be grateful to the Secretary of State for that statement, but does it not remain very odd that a major research station should be closed down after only two years? Who can think of a research station that becomes useless after only two years without any warning at all from day to day? Instead of being phased out in the usual orderly manner, can the Secretary of State tell the House whether or not this station has been closed down as a deal between the United States and the Soviet Union? Lord Carrington. My lords, the answer to the last supplementary question is uh, no. The reason why it is being closed down is, as I said, that the United States have discovered better ways of doing what they were seeking to do at RAF Orford Ness. And this. Since this program started, the new and technical scientific studies conducted in the United States have been more effective. In the light of this, it was decided that a further program at RAF Orford Ness could not be justified and consequently that the US Air Force would not renew the contract with RCA Limited for the technical maintenance of the equipment as from the 30th of June 1973. And here's the killer question. My Lord, if I may have one last question, can he tell us what are the new means of research which are going to give better results than the Orford Nest Station did in the past? Lord Carrington. My Lords, the noble Lord would be astonished if I answered the last part of his question, as indeed would all of your Lordships who know anything about defence, but it was a good try. <laughs> Brilliant. I hope what you've just watched, if you managed to watch it, is still online, because I think if what he says is true, it answers a lot of secrets. And as Peter said, if you work there, if you know tiny bit of more information about the Cobra Mist site, please, in the greatest confidence, get in touch with me. If you don't want to go public or you just want to tell me bits and bobs, that's fine. But it all adds to revealing the truth. As patrons or YouTube viewers who've just watched this film... Hopefully, it's relevant and important for you. As a filmmaker, I'm much more interested in my films reaching lots and lots and lots of people rather than making tons of money. You know, I don't do unboxing videos. I don't do reviews of iPhones. But this kind of information needs to be shared. So, viewers, do your bit. Tell YouTube by giving it a thumbs up, by subscribing and leaving a comment that this information is important. And so because of you, the truth will be out there. Thank you.